The examples we've been looking at from the states, I think, have been very ch much chosen because they're examples of good practice. I, I suspect we're here talking about British planning just to make you all feel better about yourselves, really. Um, because um, we're trying most things, we've tried most things, and we're constantly sort of throwing them away and deciding to start again. So I think it's important perhaps to just say some things um, by, by way of context. Um, okay. These are going to be the three questions each one of us is, is going to look at, which is what's, what is national planning in the UK? Um, how are the local and the stri strategic reconciled and, and who benefits from um, planning? But the, our cu current context in the UK is, is set by, uh, there are any number of these statements from our great leaders in our country at the moment. This is taken from George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, in his uh, main sort of budget of the year. It says, uh, and we are, this is a government, going to tackle the coalition government, what every government has failed to identify as a chronic obstacle to economic growth in Britain, and no government has done anything about the planning system. Cumbersome planning rules and bad regulation stand in the way of new jobs. Wow, gosh, if planning really was that powerful. But I have to say that is the rhetoric um, endless. No, I mean, this isn't just an odd statement taken from a side conversation. This is ongoing from the Prime Minister. From So that's, that's the current uh, context that um, um, we operate in within the UK um, and some things about the planning system. Um, uh, if it's complicated in most countries, we seem to have decided that, um, I was said earlier in one of the presentations, it takes time. Well, there was a period where about every 10 years in the UK we had a review of the British planning, well, the planning system, planning systems. Um, now we've gone to annual change, annual new legislation. Um, we've had uh, five acts in, in um, three years and we've just had one act last year, we've got another one coming forward. It's, it's changing very rapidly. So if it seems complicated, it is. Um, and um, uh, uh, um, uh, Vincent's going to say a, a bit more about that. Um, and alongside um, this sort of now, and this has been going on for, um, I mean, uh, um, 15 years or so now, this constant um, set of change. Alongside changes to local government structures. So um, in the immediate post-war period, we had a, a, a sort of a, 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 a mishmash, I suppose, of the structures. But from about from local government reform in the mid-70s, you could say we clearly had a two-tier structure um, of counties or, or county regions, um, and, uh, metropolitan county regions and district councils, uh, um, and much larger than uh, um, in size than most local authorities in, I mean, for instance, when you're know, talking about France and the communes. Um, but we ditched the metropolitan um, counties in the 1980s, so that sort of city region's gone by the way. Um, uh, oh, and um, we then had a structure of some unitary authorities in the, in the big cities. We then, in some other areas, we now have unitaries in the rural areas. We went regional for a bit um, in terms of actually thinking about having elected regional authorities, but because the, uh, well, um, the uh, pilot sort of uh, um, uh, uh, um, referendum on that went against it, we didn't have elected areas, but we did have regional authorities of one sort or another, um, most particularly regional development authorities. Um, now, uh, anything regional's gone. Regional is not a word you can use in governmental circles at all. So anything with regional has now been abolished. Um, so we don't have regions anymore, except of course, actually you sort of do need something regional. So some things that sort of do still exist, sort of. Um, Regional government offices, which were got rid of, but actually there's still a little bit of it still there under the um, business innovation and skills department. Biz local uh, exists. So, uh, it, as I say, it's, it's complicated. We, we did go localist for a while as well, um, and we now have, an, uh, certainly under Labour, both the regional, and then we had stress on community involvement. Um, 
Uh, the localism agenda has, has, has now gone more so under the current government with the potential to produce neighbourhood plans which are a very local scale, um, not at local authority scale, at a scale much less than that. I mean, we're talking a few thousand possibly. So neighbourhood planning, we maybe have that. Oh, and I did say we got rid of anything at the city region level. Well, they decided actually they needed something back in there. So we've now got something called local enterprise partnerships. Um, they're, not a go they're not a governmental frame, they're under the business community, uh, led by business, um, separate from the local authorities, um, don't match necessarily well they, with local authority areas. Um, some, some local authorities can be in more than one of these as well, um, and they don't really have much by way of resource other than that which they can generate themselves. Um, and local authorities themselves, and I think this is an important issue, are having resources removed from them. They're, they're hemorrhaging financial resources um, under government direction at the moment, which makes uh, life very difficult. Some of the legislation, however, does say they now have a duty to cooperate. So there's some cooperation happening, um, uh, and that's happening in different forms. So the local government context has, is changing, has changed a lot. Um, and within this, as you can see from this statement, well, it doesn't seem that government has the highest regard really for planning. So with that as a sort of setting the, some of the scene, um, Vincent's going to carry on and talk about um, national planning in the UK, such as we have it. Thanks, Heather. Uh, as Heather says, I'm going to be talking about what is national planning in the UK and give some context for that. Uh, but it seemed useful just to take a step back and just talk about the history of planning and so you get some sense of where we're coming from uh, and a core part of understanding where British UK and UK planning has come from it is actually driven by a social agenda right from the beginning and the issues of the conditions of people in the very first major industrialised uh, country and the conditions they had to live in, which persisted actually, uh, and this type of, uh, of condition I actually was involved with planning uh, in my career and there are still some horrific uh, situations. It's evolved over a long time and uh, in the kind of pre-First World War period it started with visionaries and here I put up um, one of the key visionaries that were part of it, and he is an American, in fact the only American to have a statue I think put up to him in Britain, who was George Peabody, and instead of a trust that still continues, but there are a whole range of them who actually set about to challenge the conditions there, building on health and, and the emergence professionals, and then a concern with housing and urban sprawl, and how to control it, and then more recently in post-war periods, in just renewing and clearing slums, building in sustainable de development and then more recently as reflected in the George Osborne uh, statement about economic growth driven by a preoccupation in getting economic growth and making the planning system work to that effect and that's been the evolved and so planning has taken on more and more things and asked to do more and more things but the kind of emphasis at any one time has changed and has been part of that kind of a debate about what planning should be engaged in at a national level since the war, and I put this up, and to try and understand the kind of experiences we have, the kind of changes we've had recently is part of a really kind of interesting pattern of enactment and legislation, bringing in planning acts of one kind, and then going through a kind of 13-year period, 13 year period of deregulation, where the, uh, those acts have been neutered down, and then new enactment taking place, to try and restore that, introduce new forms of planning, then deregulation from 79 to 97, and then uh, a new government bringing in new planning acts, and then where we are today into a question mark of where we're going, but essentially one actually of a pattern of deregulation. And so, in a sense of having nearly 50 years of planning experience myself, uh, uh, or getting towards that, I, I kind of sense not to worry, because we've been here before, we go through these cycles and just take the long game and do it. So, although we're in this context of where the, the, the people are going for a new planning free-for-all to a way of boosting the economy because planning's a, a problem, they'll soon learn the lessons. Uh, but we do have to face up to the fact that we are in a situation of potential decline. But if you come back and Armando in 10 years' time, we'll have it and it'll be going up again. Okay? So, just be optimistic. 
when you get to my age, you'll, you'll, you can do that. You're all too young to do it. Um, so I want to get back to the United Kingdom and, uh, and talk a little bit about that. And I put this diagram up just to, because uh, if this wouldn't be webcast, I'd have a ruder title, but it would be talking about the disunited kingdom. This is just where we're chopping off the head of one of our kings over history. But just, we have had problems of that. And we do actually have six kingdoms, when it, at least when it comes to planning. We have a Scottish Parliament and national planning, which has its own national planning framework, and it has its own uh, legislative basis. Uh, and, uh, and come 2014, as you may have heard on the news, we will actually have an, an independent Scotland, and then the Scottish people will then say, can we have a referendum and put ourselves back again? Um, and and the, then we have the Welsh, who don't have, have a level of devolution, and they're moving in, inexorably in the same pattern, I think, as Scotland. But they actually have a Wales spatial plan. Now, Northern Ireland have a strategic plan. Uh, and then we have uh, probably the most independent part of, of the United Kingdom, uh, which is London, who have their own king, um, uh, sorry, mayor, and <laughs> they have a, a London plan. And it's totally different from Wales because whilst we've got rid of regional planning and regional development agencies and so on, we haven't done that in London. London still has a regional plan, they've got a London plan, they also have their own development agency. And, and so the rest of England is, is, is a mess, and then we have places that are not even part of Europe. Um, <laughs> where we have, a ta uh, we have our own tax havens. Um, uh, so Wales and Scotland have their own uh, systems which are worth looking at, but there are questions about them because they are very small in, in relative terms, uh, like regions of 5 million and 3 million and so on. And the, as someone said earlier, it's easy to actually think and control, uh, have debates locally on things of that scale. In England, we have a national planning policy framework. But as I said yesterday, when we say something is something, we're like in Iceland, it's not what it says. Uh, so, because it really is not a national planning fr policy framework, it's actually a framework of policies that have to be applied nationally at a local level. It's not actually a, a, a framework of how the UK or England should go forward. And it isn't that difficult. Um, uh, it, it is something that can be done on the back of an envelope. <laughs> uh, I, I want to try and talk about it. This was done by a, a friend of ours, Chris Shepley, and, uh, and uh, we're here now. I said that he's not this out. I think it took at least, a, it took at least an hour. And, and the principles are always there. Civil servants are sent out there, people all across around London, and, and uh, then people come across from Europe. But anyway, it's. <laughs> so, so. so, what should be in a national plan? Well, behind this really rigorous study, uh, <laughs> there, 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 are, there are three components. One is actually the analytical framework that actually, your national plan really sets out a description of the drivers of change, the economy you're actually going to have. The communities of interest that ought to work together at a regional or strategic level, and what are the big kind of resources which we've had in from the American side, the big ecosystems or the big tracks, or um, like Tahoe Valley was it, or uh, that you talked about, uh, Lake. Um, I'm thinking of New Zealand. Um, so it, it, we have that information. I said yesterday it's there, and the work done by Manchester University with Cecilia Wong. She did work which, it, it, uh, in addition to the report, I've. Uh, let Michael have a look at, it's actually, she's done other work which just brings out how the UK works or England works in terms of these mega regions where things are so interrelated, in this case the jury to work area of London which counts 20 million people, but equally the uh, five or so interdependent ma housing market areas of another 20 million to the north and these are the real drivers of the UK economy. These are the places that need to think of how they work together, that the nation needs to have a view about how it works because you can't plan these areas by sheer aggregations of local plans. Then there are the four types of decisions. I've, it, Barry Needham talked about seven, and maybe we've talked about eight. I've reduced them down to four here, which are what are the big outcomes that you need in terms of the sheer scale of shifts, and you've got that with your California directives on climate change. And they're of that nature, big things that everyone can hang around. How you deal with some of the big imbalances that occur in terms of that. And you have that one out in the Piedmont area of Atlanta. There was this balance between the growth of Atlanta and the sheer deprivation of rural um, Piedmont region. Just address that, take ownership of it. In terms of the big 
corridors and how they should work, and then some core issues that ought to be hung together. So that was the early 2000 model by my friend Chris. Uh, I've updated it and really with more, <laughs> with more sophisticated because it's a better felt tip pen. Um, <laughs> and, and with the modern government, because now we actually have a clear wall with, with, with Wales, because that's where we're going. Uh, actually, this is off a dike, which was built pre Roman time. And this was built by the Romans, and we want to restore it to make sure we work properly. And this is the high speed rail. So, really up to date national planning. Uh, but again, I think we could work a bit better if we got the government to do it. And the last one was picking up the term that was used yesterday, a visceral understanding. What is it? What is this place England going to be? Is it going to be competitive, connected, supportive? Just the big idea. Um, I actually think the one that's a de facto idea that the government doesn't say that's there is how you sustain London. Because if you try and rationalise all the big decisions, and we do take big decisions, we don't do it, ex, you know, uh, like in France, but by a grand projet or or, what, or or that kind of sense of people knowing what you're doing, but they do it and people suddenly find it's there, <laughs> like building a channel tunnel or a high-speed link or having an Olympics or whatever it might be. But actually, this is the thing that worries them because there is a situation where London, as the most connected place in the world, is actually dropping in its significance. And that connectivity is at the heart of its financial industry and everything else. And I think it actually drops maybe further. But just that international competitive of London is so central to the future of England's economy that actually it's there. And that's there. And so that's where I'm going to stop. But it's that sense of it's dead simple, those components that need to do it. And then we're left with a simple issue. If we actually had that plan, Leonardo's going to explain how we actually reconcile it in terms of other sort of tensions. Thank you. I should have done It's great that they're contributing to this discussion is because they've really been doing the planning. Our academics can talk about it, but, but these guys are doing it. And um, Vincent was responsible really for planning the West of Scotland um, at, alongside being past president of the Royal Town Planning Institute and he's a visiting professor at Manchester. Leonora is a visiting professor at the University of Newcastle, um, but is the former deputy chief executive of the planning inspectorate. And for my sins, I was seconded to work in the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister and worked on the 2004 Act, um, something I'm not terribly proud of. Um, I really actually want to talk about tensions between different levels of planning, so it's kind of connected with this. But before I do, um, I just want to pick up something from Mark Tudor Jones's paper, and it's uh, very unfortunate that Mark's ill and unable to be here. But he refers to the um, role of the Minister... Uh, established in 1943, who was charged with securing consistency and continuity in the framing and execution of national policy with respect to the use and development of land throughout England and Wales. Sounds like a pretty valuable duty to me, so far as our minister is concerned. And that duty has been exercised by different ministers and secretaries of state through what has become an increasingly bewildering set of statutes regulations, policies and statements and uh, it's notable, it wasn't mentioned earlier so I'll mention it, that our town and country planning system in England anyway is now governed by five separate statutes about to be joined by a sixth so far as I know. So we've got 1990, 1991, 2004, 2008 and 2011 and somehow our planning practitioners and others interested in our planning system has to make sense of that complexity. However, what we don't have, and we never have had, is any kind of national spatial strategy. As Vinton has said, the national planning policy framework is in fact nothing more than a set of statements of policy that have to be taken into account in planning at lower level. There's no vision associated with it. There's no attempt to stitch together a series of what are called national policy statements on individual areas such as energy, transport, water, etc. All these major nationally important issues are all dealt with by means of individual separate statements with no overarching connectivity between them. 
Um, there was, in interestingly, a sustainable communities plan produced by the last Labour government in the early 2000s, and I have really no idea what's happened to that. It's vanished into the ether somewhere. Um, there's been, I think, a very serious lack of political leadership. The Localism Act of 2011 was really largely a, quote, over to you, citizen, approach by our government of saying, we can't do it, so we'll let you do it, um, and a great lack of leadership. And endless reviews of our planning system since the 1960s, always identifying precisely the same problem, which is usually speed, certainty and consistency, um, always leading to a new reform, but very rarely leading to any positive outcomes. This has largely been related to economic cycles and political complexion. And the impact of all of this on the operation of the system, particularly in recent times, I think has been a serious lack of confidence by citizens, locally elected members, business community, planners, etc., that we're actually any longer capable of planning our futures. So let's pick up some of the tensions, and I've listed them under four or five headings. There's a hierarchical tension. Who is actually responsible for what in our planning system now? Um, the government has a steering hand through policy and statute. There has been the impact of constant change and uh, chaos, in fact. In fact, well, our planning minister is quite keen on the concept of uh, chaotic planning. The regional spatial strategy was abolished by a letter, a very short letter, published in May 2010, about three weeks after the election, in which the Secretary of State announced that uh, regional spatial strategies were abolished. He didn't trouble himself to find out that he didn't actually have the legal power to do that, and they still exist. Um, there is an interdepart interdepartment and agency conflict and tension with a silo mentality, particularly at government level. There was an attempt at local government level through the 2004 Act and a Local Government Act to introduce spatial planning and sustainable community strategies, which did encourage local government to start to build um, internal relationships and the concept of planning for total place. Again, I'm not quite sure where many of these um, particular um, requirements have gone, but I think that they're no longer the expectation because our government takes the view that it shouldn't tell anybody to do anything other than not to do. Um, there is a functional tension between administrative, relationship, administrative boundaries and planning. We've discussed that at some length here. The 1968 Act, which uh, Vincent has spoken about, was brought in at a time when there was a single local authority and there was at that time a proposal for strategic planning, local planning and development control to all be integrated with one local authority. Then sadly along came the new administration, different uh, complexion, who uh, published the two, 1972 Local Government Act and created 400 district councils separating strategic planning and district planning and there lied uh, a great deal of tension at the, between the local and the, uh, the, the local authorities at the district and the county level. And incidentally, promoted a very large number of junior, very inexperienced planners, um, who in many cases were the only planners in the building, so they became the chief planning officer. And I think that did create some problems of um, respect between the politicians and the officers. Political tensions between central and local government, I won't bore on about that one, but there has also been political tension between local authorities, and there's a fairly notorious case of Stevenage versus North Hearts, where um, the Stevenage core strategy was found unsound because the neighbouring authority simply refused to accept the fact that the housing requirement for these neighbouring authorities had to be met in the neighbouring authority, so we have a complete stalemate there as to how the housing is going to be met in the future. And there's a lack of trust at the local level, uh, particularly citizens uh, in their elected members and in planning. Structure plans and then regional spatial strategies were seen as imposing housing targets. There was insufficient effective engagement. So now let's to move a little bit to the positive, if I can. What are the solutions? Well, at the hierarchical, plan at the right level, 
recognise there is a need for something at the national level, whatever it is, something a little bit more than a stitched together group of policies. And political and professional leadership, the need to tackle difficult decisions, and that was referred to yesterday. Uh, for example, how much housing do we actually need in our country? There was a national housing and planning advice unit set up by the previous government, which, the, the role of which was to independently and objectively assess housing need and then publish what that was. That was abolished by the new government, so we have nothing, no proper evidence base emerging at the national level. The expectation is it will all come up from bottom up. Well, I don't believe that uh, 400 local plans, when put together, is actually going to give us a national picture. At the interagency level, at the government level, it would be very good to see the merger of the Department of Transport, Environment, Communities and Local Government, or at least ministers that have some sympathy with their briefs. Nick Bowles, the current planning minister, is on public record as saying he doesn't believe in planning. And Owen Patterson, who is the Secretary of State for the Environment, is alleged to be a climate change sceptic. And at the functional level, um, the government has introduced a duty to cooperate, a statutory duty to cooperate at local government level. It's pretty it doesn't apply at the national level. Um, the question is, is that going to work? Is that going to be enough to get local government to plan for wider than local? We've got the example of the Stevenage and North Hearts, the only sanction for this is for the promoting authority to have their core strategy um, found unsound if they can't demonstrate that there has been a duty to cooperate. And that duty to cooperate is not a duty to agree. So it doesn't necessarily take us any further forward. It's a process issue rather than an outcome issue. Uh, local enterprise partnerships have been set up right across the country. Uh, there are now 39 of these business-led organisations whose predominant function is the economy. They have the power, well, they have the right, if they wish to, to do strategic planning. It will not be statutory. The worry, of course, is that if they're business-led, will they have the right expertise and right interest, in fact, to balance economic, environmental and social goals? And at the political level, I think I would quite like to see the government stop messing with the system and actually let us make what we've got work. We've got plenty of it. Um, and it is essential for local government, with the help of the planning profession in particular, to work closer together. And there is some evidence of this happening with sharing of services, for example. And uh, in areas like the Manchester City region, there is a long history of good working relationships between local authorities. I'm running out of time. So finally, local, developing the active citizen as a positive um, citizen rather than a negative citizen. Our citizens are now empowered by the Localism Act to produce plans, neighbourhood plans, that has a great potential for building better relationships with citizens, but planners, I think, particularly have to learn the role of facilitator and educator to support that bottom-up type of planning. And I, as, as somebody who's done a lot of work on mediation in planning, mediation is something that's going to be very, very much more needed within our planning system in England, which is still very conflicting and very adversarial. And I'd just like to read my last paragraph in, in the paper I've put on the, um, on, the, on the site. At this stage, it's difficult to predict what will happen to strategic planning in England or how precisely the new localist agenda will operate in practice to manage the evolution of our places and land use change. Mark Tudor Jones concludes that the reforms could lead to a greater understanding and recognition of the diversity of places. I agree with this, but I also feel that in the absence of a national vision and strategy or framework to provide a context to local development planning, there is a risk that we will not achieve the rebalancing of our nation or be able to adequately address the global challenges we face. Thank you very much.